welcome seema to the interview hi uh, thank you thank you for joining how are you doing uh, i'm good how are you all right so as you know this interview will be recorded it might be posted on social media and uh, so you are okay with it all right seema tell me about yourself about your experience what you have done so far uh, and then we can proceed with the questions okay so uh, my name is seema yadav uh, i have almost uh, 13.8 years of experience uh in that uh, relevant experience in devops will be 3 to 4 years so uh, i started with programming so my uh, core background is in programming in uh, De delphi devops uh, sorry delphi and dot net and uh, devops was a kind of a the transition happened eventually when uh, we had some requirement in the company to change implement new automation tools so in that i got to work with uh, kubernetes docker terraform ansible and jenkins pipeline so yeah mm -hmm. pipeline so i have worked in uh, an aws cloud as well so i worked for almost three to four years in that and mm -hmm. that's my experience in devops sure now what what are you looking at in terms of your next role or what what type of role are you targeting uh a cloud engineer where um, something like uh, where i could work with uh, jenkins pipeline because uh, that's the uh, best way to automate your uh, deployment and everything mm -hmm. so something like that where i can uh, use all these technologies that i just said like uh, kubernetes and docker and uh, gcp pipelines terraform and ansible all together like something that offers you this kind of uh, exposure so yep. so first kind of uh, role i'm looking for all right so seema you are you have you have uh, plenty of experience and uh, i believe that you have you have worked on sort of a senior developer role you might have managed a team uh, yes. tell me about the few projects that you have done uh, tell me so that i can gauge the complexity of the tasks that you have done okay so the uh, best one would be implementing cicd pipeline so all the stages of the pipeline uh, uh yeah, was implemented in that project so basically uh my project is uh, so for uh, code repository we use git so every time there's a change in the git uh, git commit uh, the webhook will trigger the pipeline so the next stage would be uh, build the uh, Uh, build the source code so that will be using maven then another would be um uh after building uh, for code quality we use sonar cube so that was one of the stages and then after that once it is built and it's successful um uh, the uh, it, it will be uh, the, the docker image will be built and the build uh, the image will go on the docker repository and uh, from there you can pull it so in this particular case uh, i have to provision a server using terraform so that uh, on that server i'll be doing the deployment on eks cluster or kubernetes cluster or uh, like uh, depends on the environment so mm -hmm. that's one major then another is deploying kubernetes cluster then um, using terraform to provision the servers or any any infrastructure that is required So those are the most uh, those are the kind of projects that I have worked. Sure. Okay. All right. So tell me if you are to design a highly available and fault tolerant architecture on AWS, mm -hmm. what are the key things that you'll be looking at? The so highly uh, so, available architecture and fault tolerant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for highly available, I will make sure that uh, there is a replica of the entire uh, setup. in another availability zone uh, another region sorry because availability zones are still in the same region but uh, the region if the if it is implemented in two different region then it will be highly available so in case something happens in this region it will automatically uh, the load balancer will take care of sending uh, like there, there is the term for that so it will send uh, the all all the traffic will shift to the a uh, replica set kind of like uh, the replicated environment so that is one way to make it highly available uh another was fault tolerant right yes so it's the same thing as yeah as far as i understand but tell me 
So what, what are the key challenges that you get if you are doing a multi, multi-zone setup or a multi-region setup precisely? First how, of all, how the you, price. Okay, let, let, me, let me rephrase the question. How would you manage the database if it's a multi-region setup? Uh, okay, so because data uh, in three tier or even two tier architecture, uh, everything is consistent except the database. Database is the only thing which keeps uh, changing update and all keeps happening. So uh, database have some, um, uh, there is a way to update. I mean, th th this thing will be const uh, consistently uh, updating with the replica set. I don't know the term for that, I'm sorry, but because I have uh, not done it really, but I, I have started it. So that uh, I'm, I'm talking from that experience. Um, so basically the moment you update database in your primary, um, uh, setup, it should replicate in your uh, duplicate setup as well, like the replicated one. So there is a way for that, but uh, I I don't know the term for that. It's it's just that you have to uh, constantly keep updating your database as it gets changed over here in the primary setup. So that's the way I can maintain the consistency in my databases across uh, both uh, regions. Like, okay, so that's one way. Explain me when you have a user hit hitting a website from the internet. Mm -hmm. What are the, what are the different steps that happen in the background? So if if a user puts in Google.com, dot mm -hmm. what happens in after after you hit the browser? So yeah, so that's a DNS resolution actually. So the moment user uh, enters the name, it is related to NIP. So that uh, is taken care of by the DNS uh, resolution. I mean, uh, okay, it goes to the. Um, I mean that 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 is taken care of the DNS uh, resolution, uh, where the, it is linked with an IP, and then it goes to the server, and where from there, uh, if it gets it, it. Okay, there are stages to that as well. Uh, sorry, but I I I have not really uh studied that that way but i know that uh, if it doesn't get hit over there it sends it to the some other part and if it gets it from there then uh, you get your result i mean it basically the response is in the form of a web page so that's what happens all right i was looking a bit, little bit deeper but that that's okay uh, explain me the concept of stateful and stateless infrastructure okay so uh stateful is where you have to um you have to um, stateless is where um, sorry one sec. basically the state of the um, I know this but uh, stateless is where you don't have to maintain the yeah, I don't want to say it that way uh, but uh, Okay, just a sec. I That's knew this. Thinking. I know this. Uh, you don't have to. That's all right. Don't 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 stress, Seema. That, that's okay. All right. Tell I me. know this. Yeah. Okay, fine. That's all right. You can think, and if you if you if you can recall, we can. I, I'm just not getting the keyword because it is. That's okay. okay. All right. So let's let's assume you have an application, and uh, it's it's a slow performing application. Mm -hmm. right. So all you know is that the when once a user hits the browser, it takes a lot of time for the web page to render. It, mm -hmm. And you are asked to debug and try to find out a problem. What 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 exactly is the problem happening? So what what are the steps that you will take? So rendering of the web page is slow. That's what you're saying, right? Uh, what steps I would take? Is All right, let, let, would... let me elaborate it. You, so you have an application, you have a container, uh, and which is serving a web page. Right? Your user is hitting the traffic through internet. It's going through firewalls. It's going through all the different proxy servers. It's going through your different load balances. It has got auto scaling groups. Then your traffic hits your business layer, and then it reaches your Docker containers where your web page is rendered and it's given to the customer. You also have a database which is connected to it, right? And yeah. there are lots of different security me uh, measures which which we have in DevSecOps. 
you are asked to identify that the, the, the all all they know is the customer is complaining that the page is slow okay what are the different aspects that you will check in each of these components okay so this there there's one uh, very um, basically there's no caching happening so that can be one reason why uh, it's so, very slow like something a d database can be uh, one problem in itself because a database uh, can so for that there are methods like indexing database or uh, partitioning or um, I mean, so okay. First, I will look into the database. Maybe the queries are dealing because that's that can happen. Then another would be I will look into um, maybe the uh, like we have CDN for that uh, content delivery network. So that can uh, so so the main idea is that um, location wise, like uh, because it can happen that uh, some partic only particular chunk of customer is facing that speed problem and not everyone is facing so maybe that uh, so i can look into that matter and uh, see if everyone is facing or only particular uh, people in particular region are facing it so we can have something like cdn and another is uh, i will check uh, my caching basically the, uh, if it's proper or not because that can be the reason for the delay those are the main things that I would uh, look into first. And okay. then, of course, the process is very long. So in between, there can be something which one particular service is, can cause the problem. So that can only uh, resolve after looking into every step, like monitoring. We can monitor the, uh, the whole thing. And see where it's okay. Going. So we would be, you, you would be using some sort of monitoring tool to identify. Yes. Okay. In terms of monitoring, tell me the difference between your metrics and traces. Okay, metrics are uh, those uh, metrics are something like CPU utilizations and uh, uh, memory utilization. Those are the metrics, something that can be measured. Traces are uh, the flow, basically. Uh, where I mean the so it's not. So it's not the numbers, but it's the traces is mostly like uh, which particular service can, I mean, uh, the, the lots of particular services, if that's uh, that's how we can say the traces. I mean, that's the difference between metric and traces. Do you know what, what, are the, what are the components and traces? No, no, not really. Monitoring, I have not much experience in that. It's because uh, I just know that there are tools for okay. that, like CloudWatch and Prometheus and Grafana, but and some common, very common metrics. That that's that's all right. Tell me the difference between a monolithic and microservices architecture. So, uh, monolithic is basically the whole, uh, the entire uh, structure is tightly coupled, where all the services are uh, dependent on each other in such a way that if one of them fails, everything fails. So, that's monolithic, basically. And uh, so, and microservices are basically breaking down the entire structure into small, small pieces. And every service is uh, independent of each other. I mean, it, it if it if one service stops failing, it will not really affect another service. So they're loosely coupled, basically. And um, and the work here gets easier. Like everyone, every different team can work with different microservices, and together they can combine and can have one. Uh, one complete product. So microservices are basically breaking the whole structure into small small microservices, which can be uh, uh, which which uh, communicate with each other and uh, completes the entire uh, setup. Okay. So let's assume you have got two microservices. Uh, both are from from the network point of view, both are very distant to each other. Uh, the networks do not communicate directly. How would you enable the data of one microservice to reach another microservice? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you said they are very uh, what? From from the networking point of view, they're not in the same cluster. I would say, mm -hmm. are, the network there's network segregation between them. Uh, for example, let's say uh, you have one microservice which is which is in cluster A, which is completely isolated. Yeah, and uh, it's not reaching out directly to another microservice for a data exchange. How would you enable 
the data from one microservice to be available to another microservice okay so uh, for clusters there are services for that so they have yeah. noteboard cluster ip and load yeah. balancer so i would use either noteboard or load balancer for them to communicate because cluster ip will just enable communication between the same parts in the, uh, right. yeah, in the I, okay as, as i said the, they're not in the same cluster yeah so in noteboard or a load balancer and what happens if the microservice, let's say one microservice is your on-prem, the other one is in AWS. How do you communicate between them? Um, okay. Maybe I can use something like... Maybe Ingress? I, I don't know. I, I'm, okay. I'm just guessing. All right. uh do you, do you, what do you know about API gateways and APIs? Um, it, I mean, okay, if I know I have not worked with it, so but I know I've started. I'll tell you whatever I've studied about. So it's they are the way to communicate between uh, two microservices. API mm -hmm. gateways can do that. Okay. So that's what. I think. Now uh, let's assume that uh, you are designing a a service. How do you ensure DevSecOps in it. What are the different components of DevSecOps? How do you implement it in a in an application? Uh, okay, so DevSecOps is uh, it's a very latest trend, if I'm not wrong, because I, at least this is something that I'm hearing for last one or two years, but I didn't hear it before that. But still, I have uh, I've read about it, so I can let me see if I can answer it. So one is I will uh, make sure that my Docker images are. No, no, so, hold on, hold on. Tell, tell me the different components in DevSecOps first. What do you understand uh, by DevSecOps? Basically, it's uh, ensuring the security in my DevOps. Yep, but uh, right? what different security? Like security is a very broad term. Okay, so uh, so we have a three D scan, OWASP, uh, and all uh, in the market today. Which those those are tools we use for to implement DevSecOps. Even Sonar Cube in some way comes into kind of like that because it, it's for the core analysis and all. A three D scan, I said okay, and uh, yeah, those those are the main tools that I know can uh, we we can use for DevSecOps. And so 3D scan is for Docker images and the Docker fi uh, or files. And OWASP is dependencies for, um, I, I'm not sure for what it is really, but it, it also, um, and there's Sonar Q and all. So yeah, th those are the tools that we know about DevSecOps. Anything other than the tools that you can think of in DevSecOps? Other than these, um... and I'm not talking about the tools. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there is a basic security in your um, like Kubernetes cluster in itself is very secure. So, uh, so, so the cluster itself is not really exposed. So, so they have that kind of security inbuilt in them. So. Uh, if we are not talking about any others, uh, I mean, I mean, if uh, and suppose we are using instances and also they already have the securities in the form of security groups and uh, knuckles and then um, uh, I mean, they so those are pretty secure in itself. But on top of that, if, so DevSecOps comes into picture when you want to secure your pipeline, basically. Okay, all right. So yeah, these are tools that I know. That's that's okay. Uh, now, uh, on, on the security point of view, what are the key things that you will do to secure your application? Uh, for, like I said, uh, if I'm using some server like uh, EC2 instances and all, I will use security groups. I will use. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll make sure what comes. In, I'll make sure what comes in and out of the uh, network. So that will be security group. Then another would be I will. Um, What else can we do? Uh, Jenkins itself have, uh, I mean, okay, again, whatever server that is implemented on, if that is secure, Jenkins will be secure. So it will be like, suppose I, I have Jenkins server on my EC2 server. So 
it is anywhere secure. If I'm taking care of my EC2 server, Jenkins will be secure. So that's another. Then in my clusters, I can make sure that I'm using something like load balancer. And uh, those load balancers uh, can make sure that I am secure because the because that security is taken care by the AWS, I mean, any service, cloud service provider itself. So those are the things I would do. Uh, another, apart from that, in general, encryption, of course, uh, SSL certificates are another way to secure. Then um, anything else? And... Yeah, those are the things. In general. Okay. Okay. Tell me, uh, what do you understand by SSL termination? Uh, it's a, it's another certificate. Uh, it's a security certificate that uh, is associated with the website for uh, to to make it secure. So it's HTTPS. Uh, that's the difference. I mean, it's already signed by uh, you, and you just. Okay. You right. with your now, explain me the concept of immutable infrastructure. What do you understand by this? Immutable infrastructure. Actually, sorry, I've not heard this. Um, maybe I've heard this, but it, it must have been very, very long. Okay, that's that's all right. Can you give me a hint? Like that's it. Oh, Docker is an immutable. The Im immutable means that something that you do not change, you just create a new one. For example, when you're running a container, you do not change okay. a container while it is running. You do not do an mm -hmm. update. Yet. You do you do terminate it and you restart a new one. But that that that's okay. Yeah. So there is no update say, possible for that. Okay. No, you don't. You don't update a container. So mm -hmm. you, you just terminate it and then you respawn another one. So what will be mutable then? Uh, I mean, I, I'm sorry because it's Every, everything else is everything else that you see is mutable, right? So if you have an EC2 instance, you can pro update. You can update that EC2 instance. You can provide patching to it. If you if you are running an application on your EC2, you can update mm -hmm. it. You can you can uh, do some deployments on it. You can edit the code and then you can keep keep running on your ec2 instance but docker as an example is an immutable because once you have deployed the container the container runs you don't change the container on the runtime and the, mm -hmm. that's that's why it's called as immutable okay okay uh tell me tell, tell me something about uh, your use cases in terraform how have you used terraform in your organization okay so terraform has been uh um very, very basic, uh, very, very uh, common use of Terraform was to provision servers and destroy it, if not needed, kind of. And so, they, and sometimes entire VPC and like the entire structure and provision uh, EC2 in, in, in instance that it has elastic IP, something like that. So that way I have used Terraform. Uh, have you, have you written Terraform code? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have. But tell, tell me, tell me, tell me about, tell me about uh, the projects that you have written Terraform code for. What did it comprise of? Okay, so it has, uh, so it will be uh, basically just the uh, provisioning of my EC2 instances. So there will be a provider, then there will be, um, like, like, uh, I mean, uh, what. Do you want me to explain the entire? Yeah, yeah. Explain, explain your Terraform configurations. Uh, what sort of, uh, what were the contents of your Terraform files? So I know that you are talking about infrastructure. You procure VPC mm -hmm. subnets and all. Yeah, tell tell me some more details about it. So it's it's not just VPCs and subnets. So yeah, it's uh, VPCs in the Internet Gateway. Then NAT Gateway if required if it's a private subnet, but not always. And uh, the um. So there will be VPC, there will be subnet, there will be um, EC2 instance, of course, inside that. Then you will be assigning an elastic IP to it. Uh, then uh, another is uh, security groups and uh, there's security group. And along with that, yeah, this is it. Okay, all right. So what do you understand by drift in infrastructure as code? So never heard of it. No. Okay. Uh, what do you understand by Terraform state file? 
Oh, those are the pack of files. Uh, you use in case you. Uh, I mean, for every time you plan your Terraform uh, configuration, there will be a state file which you generate, and you can use it to in case you lose your um, configuration, you can share it with others as well. Okay. Now, can you recall from your previous experience where? Where, where, where you were deploying something and it caused an outage or it didn't go as planned or some some something which didn't work out in your projects can you explain me yeah that? my kubernetes pods were crashing this mm -hmm. happened and then or sometimes it will remain in the pending state and you have to see why it's not uh, running that that has happened and, and another is uh, we ran out of space in Jenkins pipeline, so to, so we have to provision higher, uh, bigger size of the instance. That has happened. Then um, uh, those those are the main problem. Pricing is also, but pricing is not a problem. But sometimes, like you have to be very careful with your closing down your instances on time. If you're done with it, you should not forget it. Uh, that has to be taken care of. Um, yes, those are the main problems that I face. Okay. Now, tell me about the types of, have you, have you written CICD pipelines? You, you must have written, right? Because you have been talking about Jenkins and also, yeah. tell me about the types of pipelines uh, that you have written. What are the different uh, components in it and uh, is, has it, any, yeah, I mean, anything specific or anything challenging that you found about it? Uh, so mostly I've written declarative, uh, just the declarative, not uh, all freestyle, freestyle for temporary testing kind of, but those those are just actions. They're, they're not any scripts or something. The declarative is something that I've written and challenges uh, were, uh, I mean, first, like when you're new, everything looks like a challenge so understanding the flow and everything was a challenge but then uh once you get get hold of it uh kubernetes cluster can create some bonds like that part because until terraform everything goes right but uh implementing the cluster and understanding uh how the cluster really works because there are so many ways to implement cluster you can use eks you can use kubernetes you can use minikube also if your requirement is not that way like just for the practice purposes and all that and you can also use uh something uh there are other so many ways to implement classes so uh, identifying which cluster will be best for you was some kind of challenge because uh you are you have so many options but you don't know which one is best for you that was my issue in uh, classes. Then sometimes, um, uh, sometimes you your syntax error happens and you don't know uh, what happened. So you you refer the console output for that, and there is for it, it, it clearly mentions where is the problem. So that's one issue. Another is uh, identifying the stages, but that's not really a problem. But uh, uh, I'm telling you only till. Uh, Cluster, I mean, till Terraform or everything else, it's fine. But only after, uh, in cluster, you can face some problems, especially if you're very new. Uh, there is a new module in Terraform for uh, uh, Kubernetes clusters, right? That, implementing that was also a challenge for me. So maybe, uh, no, not for okay. everyone, but it was a challenge for me. So understanding new things uh, that are coming in the market and then uh, seeing if it, if it adapts to you or not. That kind of uh, R&D. So, yeah. so, as technologies are changing every day, you find that uh, something new is coming up. How do you how do you yeah. cope with learning with it? I ju you just read and try to practice it, like because I have done that a lot. So uh, that's how I uh, because there there are some uh, good uh, blogs online like Medium, Medium and. Uh, so uh, just keep yourself updated with YouTube's and all that because that's the only way right now. Mm -hmm. Or you can subscribe to Udemy courses and all. I mean, basically, uh, yeah. So those things keep coming, and you have to understand if it's uh, really relevant to you or not. So that's what I tend to keep myself updated and. Um, all right. 
Yes. One one last question, Seema, before we conclude. Tell me, convince me to hire you for a position based on the most challenging project that you have done, your role in the project, and uh, what was what were the key challenges and how you over, overcame it. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So, um, I have uh, worked on. Um, okay. So basically, my uh, expertise is uh, first of all, there are something that I've really worked on, and there are something that I have self taught. I mean, I mean, I I uh, uh, search research myself. So there are so many things I know. And uh, so there can be something that uh, I mean, if if the company needs, I can uh, bring that kind of insight into the project. So my core uh, expertise has been in CI/CD pipelines and configuration management tool like Ansible and Terraform and Kubernetes and Docker. But I also know uh, that how I can use it along with other uh, uh, different uh, cloud uh, service provider. Because I have also done some kind of R and D on GCP, and uh, along with AWS, AWS was my main uh, cloud service that I have used. So I and I keep myself updated with the new things that keep coming, and uh, I um, I think that I will be useful in a way that uh, that in when it comes to finding new things, uh, what we can use in the project. I can be useful in a way that I have some kind of exposure to all of them in some in some or different ways. There are so many things that I know, but I know that uh, you cannot use it in a project. The one I am working right now, but when it comes, uh, when we start discussing in an open discussion, that okay, what can we do for the uh, uh, to enhance the performance or something like that? So I have that kind of exposure to say, okay, maybe we can look into this problem. Maybe we can look into this problem. So I, I think in that way, I'll be resourceful and I can be resourceful in uh, uh, telling what um, uh, new things that we can uh, do with our existing setup. So I, I believe that I'll be useful in that way. Cool. And also along, along with what's going on. All right. Cool. Uh, thank you, Seema. I'm done with the questions. So what I'll do, I'll just pause the recording and I'll give you my feedback. Yeah, sure.